Uh, okay, uh, today we're going to continue on the uh, safety, <clears throat> uh, drug safety. I think uh, this will be the last uh, set of slides uh, for my lecture series. Uh, so last time we talked about safety, about uh, the uh, uh, adverse events. Like I mentioned, the adverse events is more like uh, uh, subjective that the patient can feel or the physician can detect. And uh, <clears throat> so in order to... Uh, uh, collect the data for adverse events, we have to design case report form. On, and on the case report form, there are the actual terms the uh, physician wrote it down. And then we have to go through this uh, <clears throat> uh, auto encoding process. So uh, these are the actual terms that uh, uh, the physician or the nurse wrote on the uh, uh, case report form. And before we perform any uh, safety summary or any, any tables, we have to go through this auto encoding process such that the computer will go through all these actual terms and classify them back into uh, this uh, major terms. Uh, and then uh, we can uh, process uh, this data. And after going through uh, auto encoding, there are still some terms that cannot be uh, uh, automatically mapped into the major, and then you have uh, uh, either a physician or a medical writer to go through all the actual terms that are mapped into it, and then we can sort of report uh, on the uh, AE tables. So after AE, uh, so that's the major term, so we have this uh, uh, dictionary, and the, like, like I said, the major uh, uh, was a, a very important uh, one of the very important products from ICH, they try to harmonize globally about the drug evaluation. <clears throat> and uh, the Metro Dictionary um, is, a, is a live document, it still grows. So uh, here there's a uh, version 19, I think we were now at version 2021 or something like that. Okay. Uh, oh, I forgot, there's also tests. All right, so for the tables, for the safety tables, like I described before, uh, you have on the left-hand column are the SOCs and PTs. And then the next column will be typically placebo. Placebo, and then you got an M percent. And then uh, uh, you move on to the test drug, M percent. And the rightmost column is total. You're going to have M percent. And of course, on the top row, uh, or the, on the header, is the total sample size uh, was 100%. Now, the safety table can, can be uh, produced in many different forms. Uh, so if you, it's the same kind of format. You will have like uh, uh, all causality tables, uh, treatment related tables, uh, and uh, you can have like test tables, TESS, all right? Uh, test is treatment, treatment emergent signs and symptom. Test is defined in the following way, are adverse events during the active phase that were not present at baseline or worsened in severity from baseline. So let's go back and look at uh, how the uh, safety data uh, are collected. Like I said, for every adverse event, there's a start date, there's a st stop date. Now, for each patient going through this entire clinical trial, there's a first drug date and there's a last drug date. So now, <clears throat> If you look at the time course of the adverse events, uh, what we typically uh, collect safety data is not uh, stopping at the last drug date. We usually carry another lag period. The lag period can be probably a week or a month. Let's say it's 30 days, all right? So for the patient's experience in the in any given clinical trial, there's always a day zero. Day zero is a day of randomization. So before randomization, the patient did not take any medication yet. After randomization, the patient started uh, randomized uh, medication. So this is day zero, all right? And then uh, uh, you sort of uh, continue until the last day of the uh, uh, treatment duration. Uh, if we design the trial as a four-week trial, the last day could be 
day 28, could be day 29, there's day 30 or day 26 or whatever. But as long as the, as the patient finishes this entire study for the study duration, there's always a last drug, last day of drug. Now, after the last day of drug, if we added another 30 days, so that's the, uh, that's the uh, lag period. So TAS is defined this way. If the start date is after day zero, but before last day uh, of medication plus 30 days plus lag period, that event uh, will be counted if that same event did not happen before day zero. Or if that event happened before day zero, but the severity increased. So that's test. So so we look at we look at AE, we have to look at the date, we have to look at the start date, the stop date uh, of medication, and we have to, uh, well, start date, stop date of the event. And we also have to look at the first, uh, uh, first day of drug and the last day of drug. And then we make these comparisons. Now, the AE table, there's one more set of AE table in addition to all of these kind of same format, but there's another one, it's similar format, slightly different, is AE by severity. So let me describe uh, AE table by severity, all right? So again, your left hand, uh, your, your left hand side column is uh, this SOC and preferred term and uh, <clears throat> all those. And then the next column is broken down into four columns. The four columns are mild, moderate, severe, total. And the, again, within each column, there's M percent, M percent, M percent, M percent. So, so you're going to record the number of patients experience that event, that event associated with this preferred term. The number of patients experience that event and you sort of report on the severity of those patients. And the severity you report is among all the same event this patient experienced, you look at the most severe event. So again, the AE table is reporting number of subjects, it's not reporting number of events. So these are sort of most of the uh, uh, AE tables. All right, it's the same kind of format, but you repeat for all causality, tr uh, treatment related tests uh, by severity and other kind of uh, safety tables. So AE presentation is mostly based on these kinds of tables. Uh, analysis, we typically do not perform any additional analysis. It's pretty much just summary, okay? So we don't have to, do a lot of extensive study. Uh, again, this is clinical trial. Within clinical trial, we know the denominator, we know the exposure, so uh, you can do anything you want. Uh, where the difficulty happens when you're dealing with uh, either preclinical or post-marketing, and in those situations, I mean, preclinical, of course, uh, there's the uh, safety uh, animals. It's, it has nothing to do with patients. But post-marketing is really the, the safety challenge because we don't know the denominator. So AE tables, we have uh, AE summaries, all AEs, tests. Uh, uh, I forgot to mention, SAE, remember uh, last time we talked about serious adverse events? Now, SAE is typically not collected on CRF because when SAE happens, the patients are not happen to be in the uh, investor's office or clinic. So, so typically SAE are recorded on a separate piece of uh, media. Uh, it's not on the case report form. So, so you, you sort of collect the SAE in a separate database. Uh, so you have an AE database, you have an SAE database. That SAE database is from, different from the AE database. Uh, <clears throat> in, in general, these two databases cannot be reconciled because when SAE happens, you may not necessarily have a case report form. And for AE, you're collecting from the case report form. 
So for SAE table uh, and SAE, SAE summary, it's a separate issue because for most of chronic drugs or for most drugs treating chronic diseases uh, throughout the entire uh, clinical trial, even though they have hundreds of patients, there, there's probably just a handful of SAE, SAEs. There are not that many SAEs because usually for drugs treating uh, chronic disease, you want the drug to be pretty safe, all right? So if uh, if you have more SAEs for chronic uh, for for drug treating chronic disease, um, that drug may not be approved. <clears throat> uh, so you have these different kind of um, AE tables um, by severity tests, you know, and some graphs, some graphs, and listings. Um, I think I mentioned this. Listings would be one event per line. So uh, you start with uh, a placebo group and then uh, first center, first, uh, first patient, and first event. And for this listing, you're gonna have uh, the uh, patient ID, you're gonna have the AE name, you're gonna have uh, uh, severity, you're gonna have start date, stop date, uh, relatedness, and action taken, and all these kind of stuff. All right. So that's about AE. Uh, so safety, drug safety. Uh, as a matter of fact, if you think of drug safety, uh, it really, the drug safety uh, considerations really have nothing to do with indication. Especially for most of the chronic or acute diseases, I mean, if you look at uh, chronic pain, you're looking at uh, high blood pressure, high lipid, or uh, uh, central nervous system diseases, or I mean, most of these non-oncology or non-life-threatening diseases, drug safety is drug safety is drug safety is the same. It has nothing to do with indication. So, in a way, for most companies, they try to standardize the safety reporting system. So if you, can, if you can standardize, so typically in the standardized system, you, you, you standardize both the demographic tables and the safety tables. So for any clinical trial, you're gonna have the standard tables. And, and so for safety, uh, as what I described, uh, you have uh, these AE tables, these exposure tables, uh, and of course the uh, demographic tables, uh, you can sort of pretty much standardize it. And the objective findings, now we're talking about lab data. Objective findings, including lab data, vital signs, ECG, and these kind of objective uh, uh, safety, uh, safety data. Uh, we we'll also try to standardize it. So uh, the uh, lab data analysis, um, the first thing you want to keep in mind is uh, uh, there's going to be a, a lot of data, okay? Let me describe a very simple trial. Uh, if we have a short-term trial with four, week, uh, four weeks or four visits, all right? And I, I'm not talking about a large uh, trial, maybe 200 patients, all right? 200 patients with four visits. Now, <clears throat> at each visit, uh, you're gonna draw uh, patients blood, sometimes urine also, all right? So you're gonna have the blood samples. For four visit uh, study, you're gonna have a baseline visit and then you have post baseline visit one, two, three, four, you have five visits and 200 patients, all right? So just for lab data collection, you have 200 multiplied by five, you have a thousand lab data collections. But within each lab data collection, it's easily you're gonna have uh, 20, 30, 40, 50 uh, lab tests. Uh, these lab tests are mostly conducted by a central lab. And later I will have to describe why it, it is necessary to have a central lab. <clears throat> now, uh, in in the years I joined the business, I think the central lab was COVID. Um, of course, there's other uh, big central labs. Uh, I think um, 
PPD, uh, as even nowadays is Quest. And there, uh, there, there, there are a few of these kind of uh, major industries, their specialty is analyze uh, patient uh, blood samples and patient urine samples. All right. Uh, <clears throat> now, in these central labs, uh, before we start the protocol, uh, the company will negotiate, or the, um, the sponsor, uh, the drug company will negotiate with the uh, central lab to say, okay, we're gonna run this protocol. Uh, you're gonna um, uh, collect, the, uh, uh, collect and analyze the lab data for us. And if you look at commercials from these uh, uh, central labs, uh, they claim CAM 100, all right, 100 chemistry tests. I think that's too many. We usually don't go up to 100. <clears throat> uh, but like I said, it's easy to go 30, 40, 50 uh, lab tests. Let me describe the, uh, uh, the number of lab tests you can uh, uh, <clears throat> sort of, you can, uh, perform the uh, chemistry analysis of this tube of uh, patient's lab and how many data points you can get out of it. All right, for each tube of a blood sample, uh, we start with uh, hematology. In hematology, we start with like hemoglobin, a hematocrat, uh, red blood cell count, white blood cell count. Well, when we talk about white blood cell count, it's not just a white blood cell count. There are uh, eosinophils, fields, uh, neutral fields, um, uh, uh, basal fields, and all these kind of differentials of uh, white blood cells. And then you're gonna have uh, platelet um, and, and so on and so forth. Just hematology, you can easily come up with five, six or more uh, different lab tests. And then you, you look at liver function tests. So they call, they call uh, LFT. LFT in my days, we call it the uh, SGOT, SGPT, but nowadays they change the name as AST, ALT. These are uh, the typical uh, uh, liver function test uh, indexes. Uh, of course, you, you're going to look at the uh, total bilirubin um, and uh, there's another uh, set of tests just about uh, liver function tests. And then renal tests. <clears throat> Uh, creatinine, BON, um, and so on and so forth. And these are the renal tests. Uh, <clears throat> so I'm, I'm just giving you some big categories, the big categories like uh, hematology, uh, uh, liver test, uh, renal test. And then you, you're gonna have like uh, uh, cholesterol, all right? You have uh, uh, LDL, HDL, uh, VLDL, uh, triglycerides, um, uh, total cholesterol, all those kind of things, lipid tests. <clears throat> and then you're gonna have electrolytes, electrolytes like uh, magnesium, uh, potassium, um, uh, 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 and all these, uh, these kind of stuff. So there, there are at least six or seven of these major categories. Within, within each major category, there can be easily five to 10 different kind of tests. So for a standard set of tests, you can easily get maybe, let's say 40 tests, all right? 40 lab tests. Uh, remember for our trial was 200 patients and four visits, we have 1000 tests. And for each test, you're gonna have uh, 40 uh, test record. You're gonna have uh, a total of 40,000 uh, record. So lab data, Lab data, the first impression you want to keep in mind would be there's a lot of data in it, all right? Now, then for each record, uh, so, so when I talk about 40,000 records, there are 40,000 lines, all right? 40,000 rows. For each row, uh, there's a proton number, patient ID, uh, visit date, visit number, and then uh, lab test. Uh, so lab tests, they usually start with a, a, a test number and then there's a test name. Uh, and then uh, uh, they're gonna have the lab value. So what is a, the measurement value? And then lab unit, what unit did you collect? 
And so for each record, you have all this information. Uh, but every record, there is a LLN and a ULN, <clears throat> or LLN being lower limit of normal, ULN being upper limit of normal. So what is the normal range for this test for this patient? <clears throat> well, the normal range um, is important um, in uh, any given lab test or any given lab value. You look at that value, you want to see whether that value is normal or not for this particular patient. And then you have to compare that number with ULN and LLN. If it's below LLN, it's abnormally low. If, if it's above ULN, it's abnormally high. And uh, of course, some uh, some of the lab tests, they, they even have a record to say this is uh, high, too high or too low or something like that. <clears throat> Now, when I say the lower limit normal and upper limit normal are associated with this patient is because the normal range can be different depending on age and gender, and sometimes depend on, on race, all right? So I'm just roughly describing one lab record, and then we typically have tens of thousands of these lab records and we try to make sense of it. So how do we make sense of it? Uh, now, uh, let me get back to the uh, normal range, uh, lower limit normal and upper limit normal. Uh, and then uh, let me tie it back to this idea of central lab. I still remember very vividly um, in the late 80s, or early 90s, I was, I was per performing a lab analysis, if I recall correctly, it was a liver function test <clears throat> for a drug uh, that was applied uh, to a, a Japanese clinical trial, all right? So back in late 80s, early 90s in Japan, uh, clinical trial are not that popular, and then there was no central lab. And if you look at the way the Japanese medical practice is that every hospital has their own uh, laboratories. So the patient went to these hospitals and uh, gathered uh, blood collected, and uh, uh, the uh, the lab performed the analysis and give us the data based on the format that we requested. And so let me let me describe the normal range for that liver function test. The same liver function test at different hospitals. I can describe the normal range to you so that you can you can see how difficult it could be. All right. Uh, the first hospital, that normal range is between 0.1 and 1. The next hospital is between 100 and 3,200. The next lab is between um, 10 and 20. And the next hospital, and so on and so forth. And I'm dealing with like easily 40, 50 different hospitals. And I'm dealing with these kind of normal ranges just for the same uh, liver function test. How are we gonna analyze it? So that's why a central laboratory is absolutely critical in clinical trials. I still remember in the years where in Europe, there's no central lab and we had to deal with it. But Europe uh, is somewhat different. Uh, the challenge was uh, not as bad as in Japan. Uh, but in Europe, uh, the difficulty is that the lab units could be different from the U.S. Uh, lab tests. Uh, so there, uh, in many lab tests, they have an international unit. Uh, so you have to sort of convert that international unit back to this U.S. unit of, uh, for each lab test. Well, uh, for example, the uh, red blood cell count in U.S. is a uh, number of cells per one cubic millimeter. Uh, same thing with uh, white blood cell count. So this, when, when, when I was talking about white blood cell count, there's another challenge. All right? Remember I said the total was, uh, the total WBC, the total number of white blood cell counts are composed of many different cells. Uh, 
uh, eosinophil, basophil, basal field, neutral field, uh, and many others of uh, differentials. These, these are white blood cell differentials. So in certain labs, they just report these differentials count. In some other labs, they report percentage. You have a total WBC, and then uh, when you look at eosinophil, it's a percent. When you look at basal fields, another percent. When you look at neutral fields, another percent. So, so there are all these kind of varieties you have to deal with. That's why it is absolutely critical in clinical trial. You want to have a central lab. Even with the same central lab, there are still challenges about the uh, LLN and the ULN. Because for the same central lab, after a little while, could be years or um, or, or every other year or something like that, <clears throat> the central lab want to recalibrate their system. Once they recalibrate, the lower limit normal and upper limit normal could be shifted a little bit. So when you're running the same clinical trial and the calibration happened during your running this trial, how are you going to standardize it? So there are all these kinds of challenges in analyzing lab data. And the bottom line is you, you want to make sense of these lab data. So how do you make sense out of these lab data? All right. Now remember, lab data is more objective findings. So uh, it should be a little uh, different than from handling the uh, uh, subjective findings. Subjective findings, uh, when we look at AE, is um, we look at the number of patients with a particular AE. You look at the different preferred terms and uh, look at the number of patients and, and look at them that way. But for lab data, if we have such a huge amount of data, how do we make sense out of it? Uh, <clears throat> so uh, I did uh, involve in quite a bit of lab analysis while I was at Pfizer back in the 1990s. So in the in the 90s, uh, the Pfizer standardized lab table looked like this. All right, uh, the left hand side column is the uh, uh, lab test. All right, uh, like I described, for every visit we have at least 40 tests: uh, RBC uh, or hemoglobin, uh, hematocrit. Uh, RBC and then WBC, then differentials and so on and so forth. And you get the liver function test, renal function test, and all that kind of stuff. On the left column, these are the tests. And then the next column being the uh, placebo. All right. In the placebo, they have mean baseline, a uh, median baseline. All right. They report median, median baseline. And they report median change from baseline. And then you you have the uh, uh, test rod column, and then the uh, the right hand uh, side column being the um, uh, the total. All right. So so now you can report these kind of table. I think in most of clinical trials, in most of disease conditions, this will be sufficient. You look at the median baseline, median change from baseline. Uh, I remember back in the late 80s, early 90s, we worked on drugs uh, treating AIDS patients and the lab tests, lab tests, lab data are all over the place. So we have very extensive way of performing lab analysis. So how are the lab tape, uh, data collected? All right. <clears throat> so the patient goes to the uh, uh, investor's office or the clinic for a visit. And the study nurse would draw the blood and then collect a urine sample. Uh, of course, de depend on the study design. Actually, uh, in many of the uh, chronic diseases, you probably do not need a urine sample, all right? Uh, because most of the renal function uh, are studied from blood sample. Uh, so, so you look at the the, the blood sample that will give you a pretty good understanding about the renal function, the kidney function, um, and the changing kidney function kind of stuff. Now, uh, for urine collection, uh, I think the most useful thing is to look at uh, uh, urine protein or urine albumin. Uh, now, for urine protein or uh, urine uh, albumin, 
the measurement is based on a, a, a dipstick. So it's not a, it's not a number, it's not a quantitative uh, value because dipstick is, you look at the color change kind of stuff. So for uh, urine protein or urine albumin, uh, you're gonna have um, the, the data, the data is gonna look like this, uh, non-detectable trace, one plus, two plus, three plus. So you don't have a quantity, the amount of protein or the, uh, the amount of albumin that you found from the, uh, from the urine sample. All right now back to the blood sample. The blood sample uh, in the, while the patient is in the clinic after the uh, 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 clinical evaluation, you draw the blood, sometimes one, sometimes two. Um, did I ever see three? I think probably at most one or two tubes of blood. And the study nurse has to be very careful in labeling uh, on this uh, blood tube. Uh, uh, you have to clearly identify uh, the uh, protocol number, the uh, center number, the patient ID, the data visit, and all these kind of IDs. And then you collect these data, you collect these samples, blood samples, or sometimes plus urine samples. So after collecting the data, you put in a package with dry ice and you go through uh, Federal Express or UPS, you immediately ship that sample to the central lab. And in the central lab, what they have is a huge machine, all right? So the operator, once they open up this uh, dry ice package, they're going to identify this tube is from patients such and such from uh, center such and such for protocol such and such. And then for this visit date and stuff like that. And then they pour this blood sample into the machine and the machine will perform the analysis, the chemical analysis. And after the chemical analysis, they're gonna print out the, the, the data. <clears throat> now the data storage from the central lab point of view is that uh, the company or the sponsor will have to in the contract with the central lab to pre-specify what kind of uh, data format want to receive uh, the lab data. And then these lab data uh, are going to be uh, uh, processed into the company's requirement, the sponsor's requirement into that format. And <clears throat> I think nowadays, uh, we can sort of, uh, these data can be uh, notified to the uh, sponsor immediately. But uh, again, back in the late 80s, early 90s, while I was at Pfizer, uh, there was a printer, right? That printer uh, is keep printing 24 seven, it's continuous printing. And every once in a while, the secretary will go to the printer and take out the print out. And tear down into pages, and so this page goes to this clinician, that page goes to the next clinician, and the other things, because the lab data need to be communicated with the sponsor immediately. If there's any severe lab abnormality, uh, the company or the sponsor physician will have to, uh, immediately call the, uh, uh, the site, the center, the investigator. Uh, or the clinic to say, look, patient such and such uh, has such a uh, high value on this or low value on that. Can you bring the patient back? All right. Uh, I remember the most frequent uh, phone calls was, was about a uh, liver function test. All right. Uh, so we call them and the investor says, oh, such a high value. So they, they try to bring the patient back and they realize the previous night before the uh, uh, the lab test, the patient uh, had too much drink. So these alcohol so triggered this high ASD or ALT. But in fact, uh, uh, the patient's uh, liver function was normal. So so there are all these kind of things, <clears throat> and so you have to have immediate uh, a way to immediately notify the the sponsor of any uh, abnormal lab data kind of things. But these data do not go into the uh, clinical database. Uh, so again, I'm describing the experience I had back in the 90s is that 
uh, on a monthly basis, the central lab will uh, send Pfizer a physical disk. It's a hard disk. It's, it's a huge disk. And all the data are collected on that disk. And then the data manager uh, within Pfizer, they're going to load this disk into the database and bring the data in. So that's about the lab data. Um, uh, so so uh, clinical laboratory data, we have hematology, chemistry, urinalysis. Urinalysis, like I said, is from urine sample. Mostly it's about uh, urine albumin or urine protein kind of stuff. Reference range is where I, I was talking about LLN and ULN. Um, and so another way of reporting lab is you can report how many patients experienced uh, abnormally high or abnormally low. And by the way, when I said the way that Pfizer uh, standardized lab um, uh, tables, they look at median uh, baseline median or median change from baseline. You can look at the median change from baseline to last visits. That's a typical way of reporting. Or the other, the other way to report is median change from baseline to the highest value of every lab test uh, for every patient, all right? And then median change from baseline to the lowest value. So that's another way of uh, presenting uh, lab data. Um, all right. Uh, so I'll describe the summaries for, uh, for each lab parameter. So we call them lab parameters. These lab tests we call lab parameters. Um, uh, so you can look at, uh, uh, look at change or percent change. Um, okay. <clears throat> this is a typical uh, lab graph we used to do with uh, Pfizer. Uh, remember what dealing was like uh, uh, life threatening disease like AIDS back in the late 80s, early 90s for those patients. And what we do is that we look at the uh, uh, baseline to the endpoint value. Um, and we look at some graph like this because if the, uh, the patient did not have strong response, see, most of the data will be followed this 45 degree line. And you look at graph like this, if there's some points here or some points here, uh, uh, that'll give you some caution. You want to pay attention to these uh, patients. So that's pretty much about lab data. And vital signs, vital signs are like uh, 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 systolic blood pressure, uh, diastolic blood pressure, pulse rate, uh, temperature, body weight. These are some of the vital signs. And <clears throat> that's, uh, again, objective findings. Uh, that is not subjective findings. And you can do uh, sort of summary statistics pretty much like the lab analysis, all right? Vital signs, other physical findings, and other observations related to safety to be analyzed presented in a similar way of lab data. Um, and of course, you can um, define a clinical meaningful changes, like, uh, so using some cut point. Uh, now, I probably mentioned this before. Let me mention this again. I mean, um, the difference between how a physician sees the data um, and how statisticians sees the data are very different because physician sees a patient as a complete patient. So the many ways of statistical uh, uh, summary, like we look at the mean change in uh, blood pressure, mean change in lab values or all those kind of stuff. We're looking at a population uh, uh, shift or something like that. We're looking at uh, uh, you, you're taking a sample of patients from a population with this disease. That's how statisticians see that. But clinicians or physicians, they're trained to look at the patient as an entire patient. So e even though we're talking about, well, this uh, in this trial, uh, after four weeks, the mean uh, blood pressure uh, increased by maybe four millimeter mercury or five millimeter mercury or something like that. And the physician sees those mean numbers, um, it doesn't register. But what they want to see is that, well, what I care is that how many patients their increase in blood pressure is exceeding 10 millimeter mercury. 
So then we have to define some kind of um, uh, high value or low value and look at number of patients uh, beyond the high value or below the low value kind of stuff. ECG, uh, so we mentioned briefly about ECG during the uh, uh, phase one clinical trial. We look at TQT, a thorough QT design. All right, so ICHE 14 is focused on ECG. Um, so again, the ECG, you're, you're looking at the, uh, the QT or QTC prolongation, all right? Um, so you can do descriptive summaries, you can look at uh, QT, QTC, and so on and so forth. Uh, so QTC is corrected QT. Uh, QT interval shortens um, as heart rate increases, and uh, so you have to make an adjustment, all right? Large number of QT cor uh, correction formulas, so uh, we don't really have to dive into the entire ECG. If any, uh, anyone is interested, you can uh, look in, into ICHE14 for more details. Because the best correction um, approach is subjected uh, is a subject of controversy uh, on corrected QT, uh, on corrected RR, uh, uh, interval HR, uh, as well as QT uh, corrected using different uh, formula will be submitted to all applications, uh, present both as uh, mean, median, and uh, categories. So again, categories, if you help the physician understand how many patients are exceeding these values. <coughs> so that's pretty, about, pretty much about uh, the safety uh, in the clinical trial. So, for safety analysis in the clinical trial, what we should be um, considering, all right, the first thing is exposure, all right. Uh, the denominator, the denominator exposure uh, being um, considered in three dimensions, all right. Uh, duration, number of patients, and dosage, all right. So we uh, have a clear understanding about the uh, uh, the exposure, and then you look at the number of patients with events. We're not looking at the number of events. We're looking at the number of patients events. And so that'll give you some understanding about adverse events. And then of course you look at the lab data, you look at the vital signs, you look at the ECG, and that's a sort of pretty much the most comprehensive way of looking at drug safety from a clinical trial point of view. All right, those are the individual trials. Now for fighting uh, NDA or BLA or CTD, when we say common, te uh, common, common technical document, or fighting, uh, we're also looking at um, uh, ISS, Integrated Summary of Safety, uh, and uh, or SCS, uh, Clinical Summary of Safety, uh, Summary of Clinical Safety. Uh, we can look at these kind of combined analysis. Now, in in an NDA, you've run many trials. You got a lot of phase one trials and. Uh, many phase two and phase three trials. Uh, in some NDAs, you may have like over a hundred studies. Um, and uh, typically you have at least 10 or 20 or 30 uh, clinical studies. So how do you combine this? So once you combine them, you can perform a pool analysis because, because again, in clinical trial, we have all the denominator data. So with all this safety data, there's a lot of uh, there's a, a lot of different ways we can uh, we can analyze this data. Now, for the ISS, Integrated Summary of Safety, I think the most important part is not only looking at all the studies pulled together, but also because you have enough sample size, you can look at subgroup analysis. By looking at subgroup analysis, that will help us identify, are there a certain group of patients that are uh, uh, more responsive to certain kind of uh, 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 diseases or uh, more susceptible to certain kind of uh, adverse events or something like that, all right? So how do you pull these studies? Remember I said phase one, phase two, phase three trials. Phase one, phase two are, tend to be short-term trials, phase three turn to be long-term trials. So how do you pull them and still make sense out of these data? Some are short-term, some are long-term studies. The way we do it is to look at number of patients with the events for a hundred patient years. 
So here's a way you do it, all right? <clears throat> uh, from each protocol, some, some protocol are long-term, some protocol are short-term, it doesn't matter. You look at a particular event. For this event, you look at the number of patients with the events. So that'll be your numerator. And the way you collect, the, the way you calculate the denominator is as follows. For each patient, if this patient did not experience this event, you take the last day of dosing minus the first day of dosing plus one. So that's the total number of days for this patient during this study where the patient didn't have any event. If the patient had event, then for that patient, you look at the date of the event minus the first day of dosing plus one. So now that's the exposure of that patient. And so across all studies, for every patient, you add them up for one treatment group. Again, that's your denominator. After you add up all the treatment group, you divide by 36525, which is 100 years in terms of days. So now you're looking at 100 patient years. But the numerator is the number of patients with this event. So you divide number of patients with this event by this number after dividing by uh, three, three, six, five, two, five, and you report the uh, the number of patients for every 100 patient years ex of exposure. So now with this tool, you can combine studies, both short-term and long-term studies. But what we typically do is that we pull all the parallel studies into one uh, ISS. All right, and we'll pull all the crossover studies into another ISS because in crossover study, uh, every patient sort of uh, <clears throat> uh, being ex uh, exposed to uh, different uh, treatment. For the parallel studies, we need to assume that there's no patient enrolling for the same drug trial for more than once. So you, you have to make that assumption. Of course, we have to check carefully, make sure there's no patient does that. If their patient does that, we have to have a way to manage these kind of data because the key in statistical analysis is IID, identically independent distributed. If you have two patients, you have the same patient particularly participating in the drug trial for more than once, you lost your IID, all right? And so now you can pull all these data together, all these patients uh, from the different studies together. And then how do you identify treatment groups? There are different ways to identify a treatment group. You can look at combining all the active controls into one group. You say this active control. Combining all the test doses of the uh, study drug as one group, you, you say study drug, and then combining all the placebo. So you can do that com kind of comparison. Or you can look at, at different fixed doses or different exposure of doses to break it down. And of course, you can also break down the uh, uh, type of active control. Because you have all these data, you can do it any way you want, all right? And then you look at subgroup analysis. Uh, you look at uh, uh, by gender, by race, by age, and different age cut down and kind of stuff, all right? So that's the advantage of performing a ISS, integrated safety summary. All right, um, okay. Uh, so again, for each ISS, you need to have the um, uh, uh, associated based on characteristics, demographic data and exposure data, uh, discontinuation, um, uh, AE slab and all that. All right, so now, we're pretty much done with the pre-marketing uh, kind of safety evaluation. Like I said, the true challenge about drug safety is post-marketing. After the drug is approved on the market, we do not have denominator. So that's a real challenge. That's where you need PSUR, uh, periodic safety update reports. All right, PSURs presented in the worldwide safety experience of a, a medicinal product a defined uh, time post authorization in order to report all relevant new safety information 
from appropriate sources <coughs> and relate these data to patient exposure. Uh, one report for one active substance, all right. Uh, in some drugs, uh, that drug may have multiple ind indications. Well, for example, if you look at a non-steroidal non anti-inflammatory drug that could be indicated for rheumatoid arthritis, uh, osteoarthritis, and uh, um, acute pain kind of stuff. Or a typical thing would be antibiotic. Antibiotic may be uh, uh, indicated for uh, for lung infection, uh, respiratory tract infection, for renal tract infection, or for some other infections. But for all these different infection, uh, different indications, you don't need to do PSEO separately. You don't have to do PSEO separately for one substance across the indication, you can just do one report. Report worldwide market uh, authorization status, how many countries approve the drug for, uh, for how long, all right? Safety data for the period of the report, there's an interval data. All right, interval data is different from cumulative data. All right, interval data is that if I have year one to year two of this data, now from year two to year three, I only look at from year two to year three. But if you look at cumulative data, your year two would contain year one, year two, your year three will contain year one, two, and three. So PSUR is interval data. Main focus is on AE, all right. Um, uh, from spontaneous reports, trials, or compassion usage or, uh, or literature. Uh, uh, so these will have to report to uh, authorities, okay. So US, uh, a quarterly report for first three years, uh, annual reports, EU uh, every six months for uh, first two years, annually for the next three years, and uh, then every five years, uh, Japan. So there are different requirements about PSUR. So that's pretty much what we want to talk about safety, all right? Uh, conclusion, uh, the overall evaluation should give particular attention to the events require changes, uh, medication, SAEs, and so on and so forth. So I think that's about it. Use consistent methodology for data collection and evaluation uh, throughout a, a clinical trial program and become familiar with ICH guidance. Um, pay special attention to safety in the design of clinical trials, including data capture, monitoring, coding, pooling, and all this thinking. Uh, <clears throat> CSR. Clinical study report, you, you report deaths, SAEs, other significant AEs, listings, narratives, um, lab, uh, vital signs, tables, figures, graphs. And uh, that's under the uh, E-Ray, there's different safety tables. And that completes my entire lecture series about statistical application in clinical trials. And thank you.